So a very warm welcome to everybody, uh, many of whom were here yesterday. I recognise many of you and also some new faces. Uh, if you're joining today, you're probably quite smart because we did the suffering part yesterday. <laughs> today it's the happiness part, but obviously the two go together. So as the Buddha said, you know, it's good to talk about suffering, but it's also very lovely to talk about happiness and the right kinds of happiness the kind of wholesome happiness that the Buddha recommended um, at the beginning of his uh, um, journey, his spiritual pursuit. He actually thought that all happiness should be shunned. He was very suspicious of happiness because in ancient India there was a, a, a lot of emphasis on austerities and uh, what they call dutanga. It's almost like self-torture in a sense, like going without food, sitting on uh, hard rocky mountain tops. And uh, I actually visited the place that he did his austerities for six years, barely eating. Um, I forget the name of it now. Um, but, it, but even the mountain itself is very sharp and rocky and sort of angular. And you can just see how it lends itself to that kind of view of uh, the spiritual life being difficult and the spiritual path kind of no pain, no gain sort of attitude. But actually, later on, the Buddha found that that isn't the way. There's a different way, and that path is through ever-increasing and ever-refining types of happiness. So um, today we're going to focus a little bit on that. Um, but for those who are new, and maybe for everybody here, including myself, I just wanted to recap a little bit on what was discussed yesterday. So yesterday we talked about um, this beautiful causal process and it's from the Anguttara, oh actually, I'm wrong, it's from the Samyutta Nikaya, there you go, number 12, 23, and it was all about causality and how suffering can actually lead, when it's re regarded and responded to skillfully, how it can actually lead to happiness. So it's not something to be uh, avoided, it's not something that can be avoided, some of the suffering in life is inevitable. But we also add a lot onto that by unskillful ways of regarding suffering. And one of those unskillful ways is simply by not wanting it, thinking that something's wrong with the fact that there's disappointment and pain in life. And of course, when we have that view, we, we kind of take it personally. We take life very personally. And the suffering really hits harder doesn't it? When we feel like, oh, this must mean there's something wrong with me, maybe I'm just not worthy of a happy life, or, you know, I've done something wrong, I'm not enough. This is, uh, I think, a complex many of us carry, and sometimes that's simply because we're not being realistic about what life can really offer. So the Buddha showed that there are different ways to respond to suffering, and the first is to actually meet that suffering, in a sense, head on, but very gently, by turning just towards it and learning to respond rather than react. So to respond with compassion, um, with a sense of kindness and gentleness. And, um, of course, to take the Buddha's teachings to heart and to understand that he did address these things. He also addressed the causes and the way um, out of suffering, the way to live a happy life and to... Um, to reorient our minds towards a different kind of happiness, which comes more from meaning than from uh, feeling per se. So even in modern psychology, a lot of research has been done into happiness, and there are two types, two basic types. One is the hedonic happiness, which is just that kind of pure pleasure or pleasant feeling, pleasant uh, excitement in a way of the senses. And the other is eudaimonic, which is the happiness of meaning living a values-aligned life. So we try to open our heart to the suffering, but also to the universal nature of it, the fact that we're all in this together, um, and that the solution has to be universal. And this is very beautiful. In the Buddhist teachings, uh, he actually says that the best kind of um, life we can live is one that benefits ourselves and others. And the second best kind of life is not one who benefits only others, but one who be that benefits ourselves. The worst kind of um, way to operate in life, perhaps, is to only think about others. So that's really interesting, isn't it? And, and sort of um, uh, 
it goes against that idea of self-sacrifice being the most noble path to follow, you know, or giving at the expense of our own well-being. And of course, I think, I don't know, many of us are conditioned that way. I think especially perhaps women who have been conditioned as women, brought up as women, often have this idea that we have to give, 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 give. And if we're tired or if we're struggling, never mind, you know, it's, it's wholesome and skillful to keep giving. But the Buddha's saying, bring your own benefit into this. And ideally, that is the best way to benefit others as well. So our confidence in the Buddha's teachings can grow through that suffering. It can initiate a spiritual search. And um, first of all, we can, we can get inspiration from recognizing the good qualities in other people that are on the path. You know, that can be a real source of encouragement for us. And also our own experience, you know, as we develop the path, we start to get an experiential understanding of how this is of benefit to us. So our confidence grows hand in hand with, with the wisdom. And uh, sometimes in the Buddha's teachings, people believe that we have to balance the confidence and the wisdom. That if you have too much confidence, maybe there's not enough wisdom, or if you have too much wisdom but not enough faith, this isn't going to work. Uh, maybe the second one is true because confidence or faith is the beginning of the path. But actually you can't have too much of it if it's the right type. If it's the type that's verified through your experience, that remains open to inquiry, confidence and wisdom grow together. And it's actually extreme winning when one has the first experience of enlightenment that the confidence is said to be unshakable, it's at its peak. So it's something that supports us all along the way. And in this lovely sequence we discussed yesterday, it's the confidence that leads to joy. And uh, hopefully some of you have experienced that, you know, the confidence that you are on the right path and that there is something in this meditation that has meaning for you and that can help relieve some of those um, uh, mental sicknesses in a way, you know, the anger which the Buddha likened to being sick or the greed which always feels, keeps us feeling that we're lacking something. Um, and all those other tendencies we have, you know, impatience, that's one that I sometimes have. Like I have a lot of kindness and compassion generally, but I've noticed that sometimes I'm a bit uh, eager, you know, to see things happen quickly, even if it's in the world, you know, it has to happen quickly and the harder I work, the faster it'll happen. <laughs> and sometimes that lack of patience is just a kind of... Um, the mind just moving on a little bit in our practice, not quite being comfortable or satisfied with where we are. You know, we want to be where we are so that something will happen next. And that in itself is a cause for not really finding contentment right now. So um, today I wanted to look a bit more at happiness and how the Buddha defined happiness. And as I said, uh, in the beginning of his spiritual search, he felt that happiness was something not to be cultivated. But then, uh, after about six years of this aesthetic, aesthetic or austere practices, which were actually um, kind of torturing his body, the fable goes that he could touch his tummy and feel his spine. He was that thin, and uh, the hairs were coming out of his head. They were just falling out, you know, hair loss. People, even today, maybe people with eating disorders have experienced this. You know, you start to lose your vital nutrients, and so he was very, very weak. And um, he realized at one point that at the age of seven, he'd sat under a rose apple tree while his father was uh, busy plowing the fields. And at that time, he'd felt so relaxed and so safe and so at ease. He had no cares in the world, you know. You can just imagine this young boy raised in a very comfortable way and his father's out there in the sun and he's just relaxing in the shade of this tree. And he just automatically had the experience of deep meditation. Um, jhanas, basically, the way that the Buddha defines those states which are actually stages of letting go. They're not attainments as such, but they're things that happen when we are very, very deeply at ease and amazingly often when we least expect it. I'm sure the Buddha as a seven-year-old boy didn't expect anything like that to happen. And he'd even um, forgotten those experiences or written them off for a long time thinking that can't be the path. But then the memory came up 
And he thought, what if that is the path? And then an intuition arose, it, maybe it is the path. And it was from that point that he started to uh, eat again. Uh, he was offered some rice pudding. <laughs> I'm sure everybody probably likes rice pudding. This is like rice that's boiled in milk and probably some honey in there. And this was quite a luxurious food, even today in India. That's uh, one of the favorite desserts with a bit of cardamom. So he ate this uh, rice pudding and, and that preceded his time under the Bodhi tree where he got enlightened. So he realized that that kind of happiness is to be pursued. Yesterday we talked about um, sensual happiness and that the Buddha talked about the dangers. He talked about the gratification of those pleasures, but he also talked about the dangers and said it's not to be pursued. But this is the happiness that is to be pursued. And uh, he defined those happinesses of jhanas very beautifully. Uh, the first term he applied was nekama sukha, which actually means the happiness of renunciation. So yesterday a few people here said renunciation was a positive thing to them in their mind. It has positive associations. But to many of us we think, oh dear, that means we're going without something, you know, renouncing. Oh, I don't want to let go of my comfort or you know, my pleasures. But uh, this is the happiness that's born of letting go of a great deal of suffering. The other term, it was nekama sukha, uh, paviveka sukha, which means secluded. And in this case, it means secluded from unwholesome states of mind, really secluded, so that, you know, any um, possibility of greed or aversion of any kind entering the mind is abandoned for that period of time. So you're completely secluded from obviously unwholesome thoughts and uh, habit patterns for that time. And, uh, you know, you can hear about these states even in, uh, in many traditions, in the Christian tradition, in mystic traditions, maybe Sufi traditions. And sometimes they're so um, blissful and so uh, otherworldly that people talk about them as union with God or union with divine love or cosmic consciousness and all kinds of other descriptions because it really is secluded from your normal state of mind. Uh, in Buddhism it's actually uh, likened to being in the Brahma realm, it's being in another loka, in another plane of existence. So what I've understood from my teachers is that these states are even secluded from the five senses themselves. So this is going kind of deep quite early on in this talk but I'm going to talk about other kinds of happiness leading up to that. But, uh, but these are really superior human states, Uttari, Manusa, Dhamma. And um, the transformation on the mind is, is incredible, it's powerful, because you're seeing something um, completely different, a different taste of happiness than you've ever had before. So they're secluded in the sense of secluded from the five hindrances, but also from the five senses. And this is just the pure pleasure of the mind. And then the next um, description he gave was upasama sukha, which means the happiness of peace. And this is really deep, deep peace, you know. I mean, I think we can experience that to various degrees in our practice. Even when the thoughts just stop for a moment or you recognize that gap between the thoughts, there's a sense of stillness and peace there. And um, at first it might feel a little bit threatening or, you know, frightening even to, to be surrounded by so much silence. But after a while, when we soften into it, we can find there's a joy just in having a quiet mind. So we can learn to tune into these feelings. And as they deepen, they can lead to this happiness of peace. You know, it's not a drab or a bland or a dull state of mind. It's very, very energized. And then the last one, which is the most alarming or startling or surprising, I guess, is that he um, defined these jhana states as sambodhi sukha. I don't know if you probably all know the word bodhi, which means enlightenment. Sambodhi is full enlightenment. So the happiness of enlightenment, but actually this is only a temporary bliss. But it's so close and it's so powerful that it gives you a taste of how it would be to be without these hindrances, without, um, yeah, with, with a much more refined um, mind permanently with enlightenment. So this is giving you a taste. <coughs> and just recently, <coughs> I was speaking to my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, about this, 
because in um, Myanmar, in the tradition that I came from, there were some very powerful teachers in our lineage and um, they had a lot of students on retreats that would seem to get some very deep meditation and, and there was talk about whether these were enlightenment experiences and some people thought they were, you know, a kind of taste of Nibbana itself. Um, and I was wondering, is it or could it be something else? Could it be that there are so many profound states on the path that, um, you know, it could be even a jhana state? And Ajahn Brahm said, yeah, quite likely, because they are tastes of enlightenment. And uh, stream winning itself is a very, very high stage on the path. But there's a lot of happiness to be had leading up to that. And um, this is the happiness that the Buddha really said it's good to pursue. The nice thing about this is it's not a pursuit through an act of will or through an act of control or over-efforting or anything like that. It's uh, actually um, experienced through letting go. So you can't have the happiness of renunciation by craving, right? It's the opposite. To have the happiness of renunciation, we have to let go. To have the happiness of peace, we have to be peaceful. Right? To have the happiness of seclusion, we have to be secluded from unwholesome states. We can't crave and then expect to land in a place of non-craving or letting go. So the path has to be as the result. And the result is a, you know, a gradual refining of those mental uh, attitudes, if you like. So there are many different types of happiness, so don't worry, because we, most people here are probably not going to experience that in three days, unless you're very, very skilled meditators, or just lucky, and you happen to, as my teacher says, press the letting go button, it can happen anytime. But uh, this is not the goal. The goal is really learning to relate wisely to our minds and develop these qualities little by little along the path. So just to give you a sense of how much happiness is described in the suttas, I wanted to, uh, don't worry about the Pali, but it helps me remember it. But um, there's lots of types of happiness. And one of the first that the Buddha talks about is the happiness of blamelessness, anavajasukha, which means blameless bliss. And this is just the happiness of living a virtuous life. You know, yesterday we talked about uh, the happiness of non-remorse, even counting up, you know, chalk it up. I didn't kill anyone today. Good, that's a point. <laughs> you know, I didn't shout at anyone today. Write it down. Make a note, you know. Make a note of your restraint and find some happiness in that. And of course, the happiness of actually living a beautiful, virtuous life is very evident. Even this morning, a couple of you were looking after me. I had so many offers of tea and different cups of tea coming my way. And uh, someone told me about a dream they'd had of, of being generous and selfless and pointed out that when you associate with good people, which means just hearing the teachings, then you tend to have very positive and wholesome thought patterns, which brings happiness. It gives you beautiful dreams. Uh, it gives you good intentions, whether or not those things are actually um, come to fruition or not it all starts in our mind. So we see our mind starting to change. And uh, the happiness of virtue also is related to serving, to service. I've seen across 28 years of practice now that um, I'm always really grateful to Gorenkaji, my first teacher, because he said practice and a person's development on the path should be measured by two things. So this is not jhanas, this is not even enlightenment. It is a sense of gratitude and a feeling to serve others without expecting anything in return. And I just find that so beautiful and I've noticed that um, if a person is doing a lot of meditation but never thinks to serve a retreat or to volunteer for Sheffield Insight and join the Trust <laughs> or whatever's needed, you know, whatever's needed and whatever you have the capacity to do, then you can't really practice on the path, not fully because the emphasis is still very much on oneself. And it's just natural, isn't it? For me, it was very natural that when I experienced something that changed my life and gave it meaning, I just wanted to tell everyone about it. And I'd received so much on a donation basis, all these retreat centers in Asia and even in the West, 
the way that um, the Goenka retreat centers work is that they operate entirely on a donation <coughs> basis. So only people that have benefited from the retreat can give donations at the end. They won't even accept donations from anyone who doesn't um, complete a retreat. And I think there's something very beautiful in that. And it evens itself out. So you can know that wherever there's a center, it's because people want it, people benefit. And those who have more give more. Those who have less are able to benefit from those who've been generous toward them. So there's this enormous sense of gratitude and appreciation for what you've been given. And as a result, I just wanted to serve. I didn't have much money. I lived on 20 pounds a week in India which even then wasn't much at all. <laughs> it was looking for the cheapest possible thing to eat and staying on like mud floors without a bathroom or anything, just village floors and showering in the waterfall and that sort of thing, getting on local buses every month to get from A to B. And, uh, but I had time and I had the motivation to want to give and I don't think I could develop my practice well without the opportunity to serve. So this is an enormous source of happiness, and that's called the blameless happiness. Of course, we can also learn how to um, attend wisely to the people, the situations in our life, to our own mental behavior too, to attend to it in ways that is generous, that is kind, that sees the best in ourselves and in others. And there's a certain happiness to be had of that. And the Buddha called that... Um, <coughs> Bla not blameless, unblemished bliss, abhya sekara sukha. And then the happiness of mindfulness. Has anyone noticed that mindfulness is happy? Yeah? When you're starting to brighten up in the mind, you're starting to feel a bit clearer, a bit more lucid. You've woken up a little bit out of your slumber. You can see what's going on. And if mindfulness is uh, well-directed and, again, without too much force, you may start to feel the energies arising, the energies start to build because we're not wasting energy with unskillful reactions or you know, excessive thinking or we're much more present to the moment and so the energy can be available to the moment and the mindfulness and the energy and the joy start to build. And these three together create what's called a feedback loop. The more mindfulness there is, the more energy arises, the more energy that arises, the more happiness in the mind. And that happiness feeds back into mindfulness. So our mindfulness improves and then eventually leads to samadhi. And again, samadhi is a process. Um, samadhi usually refers, sama samadhi usually refers to the jhanas, but um, samatha, which means calm or calming, is a process and the mind calms increasingly the longer we can sustain our awareness with the task at hand. So this is a kind of happiness. And then also there's the happiness of contentment, which is one of my favorites. I just think that's such a beautiful kind of all-embracing happiness because it really means no matter what happens, no matter what, we can be accepting and we can even embrace it. It's quite a high stage on the path. I mean, you could say contentment is the highest goal. You know, to be con so content that you don't want anything in the world. There's just nothing more that you need. This moment, who you are now, the mind as it is now, is completely enough for you. And, and genuinely enough. It's not just, oh, this is good enough, it should be good enough. It's genuinely enough. It couldn't be any different, right? You are where you are right now because of everything that's happened to lead you to this point. And this is the only option we really have is we can either learn to perceive life through the lens of contentment or we can carry on our old habits of looking for happiness somewhere else. And we're never going to find happiness somewhere else because we're, never, we're always going to be in the moment. We're never going to be in the future. The future is going to become the present. So we need to find this different relationship with now, with this, with right where we are. And that happiness and contentment is actually a part of virtue. And you can see that just in terms of, say, the climate crisis that we're in now. I mean, if people could actually be content with what they have and would stop exploiting poorer nations, you know, um, 
to fulfill their excessive greed rather than need, then um, everyone would live a safer, more happy, more resourced life. You know, we could share our resources with those with less instead of, um, what's the word? Pill, pillaging, pillaging, is that the right word? The resources from places that, yeah, basically the government may be corrupt or whatever reason. So contentment is a very beautiful thing. Sometimes people say, well, what do monastics really do? You know, what do you do for climate crisis? I mean, some people do go on marches and they do get quite involved. It depends on our particular, <clears throat> I guess, calling in a sense. But also, as monastics, you sort of renounce. And uh, I put my life and my kind of wish to serve into the hands of my teacher in a sense by saying, you just tell me what to do. Like, you just, you can use me basically, to serve the Dhamma, however you see fit. And uh, so my way is to try to uh, obviously teach the Dhamma, but also establish places where people can practice, because I think we need each other, we need community. And I want to give women the chance to ordain, and not to have this horrible glass ceiling whereby they can only ever be novices and they can never actually take decisions in their community, but they feel valued as genuine spiritual practitioners with the same potential to awaken as everybody else, in other words, as men. <clears throat> um, but part of that, of course, is establishing places that people can get together. And I think this in itself, not having kids in itself, is a contribution um, towards curbing, you know, this... Uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't have children, but this is another way to uh, address the issues of... Uh, the climate crisis, and to try and live simply. So there's the contentment with little, and also, as I said, contentment in the moment. And then the happinesses of everyday life, the happiness of inspiration, the happiness of uh, just a bit of quiet time, the happiness of wise association, being with spiritual friends. Um, I would include the happiness of nature as well, and that's very much included in the, in the Buddhist texts especially in the verses and poems of the early Buddhist monks and nuns. Um, they have these beautiful books called the Terivada and the Theravada. Uh, sorry, Terigata and Theragata, right? <laughs> I'm a bit tired still, so, but... Uh, these are basically the verses of the enlightened monks and nuns, and they would be sort of spontaneous um, poems of awakening. You know, they'd have a moment of insight. And uh, many of these poems contained a lot of verses about the beauty of nature. Uh, there's one uh, by a very austere and ascetic monk called Venerable Kasapa. And uh, he was famous for wearing rag robes. You know, so that meant he just found old rags on the street, on the road, and would kind of wash them, sew them together, and go around with these really coarse... Um, robes that most people wouldn't want to wear. Maybe they scratch the skin or whatever, but he was content with that. And he lived um, a lot in nature, on rocks and in caves and under trees. And he had these beautiful verses that were like, these rocky uh, peaks delight my heart. And he'd keep sort of saying this and about the beautiful dew and the moss that covered the rocks. And the refrain was always, these rocky crags delight my heart and uh, the deer with the big eyes, and I'm not really a poet, but just to give you an idea of the way he would rejoice. Um, it wasn't just like, yeah, nature's okay, kind of, I'm, I'm busy in my mind, and yeah, nice tree, whatever. It was really soaking it in, you know, and, and making that part of the spiritual practice. So I think there's something about nature that is very much aligned to the Dhamma, because it's raw, it's real. Yeah. One of the reasons I love Australia, I don't really love the culture because the culture's been pretty much ruined by the white folks. But yeah, I mean, there's good people everywhere, but there's something about the land, especially Western Australia, that's incredibly raw and pretty severe in many ways, but very pristine and untouched. You know, you have some of the rock formations under the uh, ground there that are huge. They go on for like big chunks of Western Australia, one rock that, you know, basically has no movement. And uh, that part of Australia was also connected to Gondwana. It was part of Gondwana, this major, like, what do you call that? Like a super, um, 
continent, like a supercontinent, thousands, I suppose it was billions of years back, before Australia and India parted. And the rocks in Western Australia were apparently um, the same as a certain layer in the Himalayas, a certain layer of rock. Um, so we always kind of have this little mythical, inspiring story that perhaps the Buddhas of the past walked on this land. But it certainly feels very raw, very spiritual, I would say. Yeah, Timeless and very grounding as well. So there's something about nature that can give us a lot of delight. You have the Peak District here. I grew up in Chesterfield, so I know how gorgeous it is. And uh, it's important to get out, you know to uh, just connect with the elements, connect with your body, enjoy that space for yourself and that feeling that you're part of something so much bigger. You know, it's not just us and our head and our phone, but it's us and the natural world. We're part of nature, we're no different. I mean, the indigenous Australians know that very well. They don't talk about nature as something uh, they can observe, they talk about themselves as nature. And uh, that's very obvious if you live in it. So all these things can be enjoyed. So as usually I'm speaking longer than I expected, but I want to get into, um, <clears throat> into uh, how the Buddha defines happiness a little bit more. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll just drink something. <clears throat> That's something being tea, of course. <laughs> So yeah, so the Buddha <coughs> talked about happiness as uh, that which, which results from confidence. So yesterday we talked about that, the joy that can arise from that. But now the next link in this chain okay. is from the joy in daily life, Pamoja, to Piti. And there's another beautiful sutta that actually says that for one who has that joy... <laughs> No effort needs to be made, no will needs to be made. May I experience piti, which is the meditative rapture. It's natural that one who experiences joy experiences piti. In other words, the bliss of meditation. So this gives you a clue already as to the type of joy we're talking about. Again, it's the joy that's born of letting go and relaxing that sense of will, that sense of being the doer in our meditation, and just allowing a process to unfold. So it's a very important um, part of meditation, and it comes in both the breath meditation and also the metta meditation. And uh, for those who have studied a little bit about breath meditation from the suttas, the Anapanasati Sutta. Um, the first part of the breath meditation and the instructions is all about experiencing the breath coming in and the breath going out. And then learning to notice if the breath is long or short. And later learning to notice the whole of the breath. So you, you're not just noticing the length, you're not just noticing the fact that it's coming in or out, but you're actually able to sustain your awareness for a whole breath as if the breath is resting, the mind, sorry, is resting on that breath. So it's a bit like the hand moving, you know, the in-breath and then the end of the in-breath and all the way through that breath. So we start to really still the mind and experience more and more of the breath. And then the breath naturally starts to quieten. So none of this is like doing. The Buddha only says we have to know these things. We have to know whether the breath's coming in or out, whether it's long or short. And this is just to get the mind interested in the breath. And then it starts to calm. But then the next uh, section in that um, sutta is actually that joy starts to arise with the breath. So, and that's called piti. And this joy arises after the mind and the breath become a little bit calm. And my teacher Ajahn Brahm says this is kind of the pivot point of meditation. It's from this point that there's enough interest to sustain the mindfulness with that breath. It becomes easy to watch something that's pleasant to watch. So we don't need to kind of hold on so tightly. And in the suttas there's this lovely um, analogy of a bird and uh, 
and the Buddha says that you can hold that bird. If you hold that bird too tightly, you crush it, right? But if the grasp or the hand, the holding is too loose, that bird flies away. But when the bliss starts to arise in the mind, the happiness starts to come in and there's a natural attraction to the breath. You don't need much force at all. You can just hold that bird, if you like, the bird of the breath, very lightly with your hand, very gently. And that bird starts to settle and feel the warmth. It feels uh, like there's enough to hold it there. There's enough protection and safety there. You're kind of caressing it in a sense. You're treasuring it, you're nurturing it. So you're not letting it go, but very, very little force is needed. It's a very gentle touch. And it's from that point that the mind really starts to energize. So this is very, very different from um, sense pleasure. With sense pleasure, it kind of drains the mind. It agitates the mind. It takes energy away. But in this case, because we're letting go into that bliss and that bliss is arising from quietness, the more we're able to let go, the more it keeps arising. I like how Ajahn Brahm talks about it. He says that you're gradually removing energy from the doer. I mean, there's no person in there that's doing, but from the doing, let's say, part of the mind. And the energy starts to flow into the knowing instead. So it becomes more passive and the mind gets peaceful. And just as that's an important stage in breath meditation, it's also an important stage in every kind of meditation. And uh, one of my favorite meditations is metta meditation. And that has the special advantage of arousing a lot of happiness fairly early on in the practice, fairly early on in the meditation itself. Because even just thinking thoughts of loving kindness is already quite a beautiful thing. You know, there's already a joy in the fact that you're having a good intention even before you start to feel pleasure in the body and mind. There's a sense of um, at least overcoming the unwholesome thoughts. And so we begin just by introducing phrases of well-being, well-wishing to oneself and others. So simple things like, may I be happy, may I be well. And if we listen after that phrase, you know, just listen sort of with our body, with our heart, with all our energy and mindfulness, we can feel a certain resonance there, like it leaves a beautiful effect. And it might take some time to start really tuning into that. It might take half an hour, a whole meditation session, or even a few days. But uh, it doesn't matter because we're protecting the mind by keeping away the unwholesome thoughts. And gradually those thoughts start to become moods, start to become emotions, and start to fill up the body and mind. So you start to actually experience the meaning of love, the meaning of loving kindness in your body and mind. And it's not really something that can be described in words, but it's sometimes it's just a softening of everything. You know, the body relaxes, it settles. There's more spaciousness. There's a feeling of being resourced, of being kind of filled up. And the Buddha called those things protective meditations the four protections. So there is a feeling of being almost invulnerable to maybe harsh words or even difficult memories. They tend not to come up in the mind, but if they do come up, <clears throat> they kind of bounce. <laughs> You're feeling so kind of settled and so resourced and, and well in yourself that these things don't have a big effect. So this is really interesting practice because we start to see how the quality of our mind actually shapes perception. Not only how we perceive, but even what comes to mind in the first place. <clears throat> and of course, um, that enables us to start letting go and the words start to fade, the words are less necessary and the mind can become quiet and more and more unified. So that pleasure is a sense of um, fulfillment in a way that we, we can really start to relax. And as a result of this kind of happiness that comes from the mind, we can let the mind become more and more tranquil. So the next stage is from the piti to the pasadi, which is tranquility of mind, tranquility of body as well. You start to be able to sit for longer because there's nothing particularly unpleasant about your experience. Even if there is, you have such a lot of loving kindness towards it. Sometimes you might want to move, change your posture or whatever. 
Other times, you know, you just carry on. You might not even notice that you've been sitting for three or four hours and uh, the time's just flown by. So, um, so this is a little overview, but I just wanted to quickly go through some of the issues um, and give you a little troubleshooting guide in case you're not feeling any happiness in meditation and you're wondering what's gone wrong. The answer is nothing's gone wrong. <laughs> it's just a matter of relaxing, relaxing into the practice, into the process with a, a deal of trust, a little bit of trust, and also patience, the beautiful word patience, which sounds, I guess, in English a little bit like endurance sometimes. But in, uh, in the Pali, the word kanti really means um, a kind of acceptance, but a beautiful acceptance. I'm trying to remember the word. It's more like, it's more like consenting to whatever is happening right now. It's welcoming it. It's being with it and waiting with it. So actually being a friend to whatever's happening in the mind. So there's a difference between patience that waits for something to change or for something to happen and patience that's just waiting with. So you're just waiting as a friend with your experience. You're not hoping it will change, wishing it will change, wanting it to develop. You're just right there with this beautiful consent, consenting to the moment. Yeah. So patience is another beautiful um, attitude we can have. And another one that's important that I wanted to share is... Um, Again, not looking for anything special, but being content with what's there. Yeah, not looking for something that is not there, but looking for what is. Really being receptive to what is, listening to your experience and landing with it and opening to it. Because sometimes we have these ideas that bliss should be something very obvious. You know, we compare it with the happiness of the world, something quite coarse and exciting. But the happiness of meditation is very, very subtle. And sometimes we don't notice it straight away. You know, sometimes it's enough just to, to try and notice the happiness that's there. And it can be really humble. Again, we're not looking for anything special or anything that's not there. Yeah? We're trying to notice and be content with what is there. And when we do that, everything can change in an instant. It's amazing. I just taught a meta retreat in Devon. And uh, two retreatants experienced this exact thing. I kind of uh, mentioned in a talk that PT, this happiness of meditation, can be very, very quiet. It can be very still, almost unnoticeable. And they took it to heart and two people on the same day, actually, I think it was the same day, said that they just developed this sense of contentment and, and suddenly everything changed. One of them got this big blue light in the mind and so they it went into a more mental experience. So the mind became much subtler, much more empowered and bright and blissful, but in a very gentle way. And the other person had an experience of their body kind of changing its shape. Maybe many of you have had this experience as well. It's kind of when our perception starts to, Ajahn Brahm calls it, take wings. So it kind of comes out of its usual confines that, oh, this is a body and this is how a body feels, this is my knees. And it starts to kind of, or you can feel like you're, I've had this a lot, where you feel like you're sort of sinking, but the body's kind of almost like disappearing and the mind is becoming predominant. It's like the mind gets empowered. And this is all kind of pre-deep meditation stages, but it's a sign that you're starting to let go. You're starting to allow the energy to go into the mind and this happens when we're content, when we actually turn up our eyes, if you like, turn up the lights in our mind so we can see what's happening. So if we're always looking for something else, we're not going to have that presence of mind. So this is very interesting. And then in my experience, really, sometimes joy can arise almost directly from suffering. Of course, the confidence is there in me very strongly for the Buddha's teachings and the path and the practice. But uh, there's been times in my practice that I've been through a particularly hard time and sat down to meditate and just accepted the situation and found that attitude of compassion towards it, which is hard to explain, but it's a kind of, I suppose I experience it like 
I suddenly become this older, wiser person looking with eyes of compassion on whatever's happening, like genuinely embracing it and looking at it with warmth. And almost in an instant, something can shift, like all this contraction or tension, even anxiety, can just seem to kind of dissolve and, and disappear, and it's replaced by joy. So this is not a doing, this is more an accepting of whatever's in the mind. So this is, uh, these are some of the attitudes that are very key to the practice and that can lead to this kind of um, delight in meditation. So this is not to um, you know, encourage us to look for it as such or to make it happen in any way, but just to say that there's a lot of happiness here already if we look in the right direction, if we just learn to be a bit more content. So um, I think that's enough. That's more than enough for now uh, to give you a little bit of an uh, overview of the happiness of this path and the fact that it comes from letting go. So just trusting this process and allowing it to unfold. So we still have time to do lots of meditation this morning. So if you like, you can have a stretch or if you need to have a quick toilet break. We'll start in five minutes. You all look like you're meditating already, but I just wondered, I mean, I'm probably going to do it anyway, <laughs> but who would like to do a bit of meta meditation? All right, good. <laughs> okay. If you don't want to, of course, you can meditate in your usual way, however best uh, serves you at this time. And uh, also to say that I'll give a few instructions, probably for the first 10, 15 minutes. Um, and after that, just see where it leads you. You can carry on with the metta. Or another lovely thing to do is if the mind is quiet and if you just want to simplify, you can keep that mood of metta but turn it toward the breath. Or if you like, allow the breath into your mind so that your breath almost becomes another object of that loving kindness. And you'll probably just find this happens naturally um, if your mind is so inclined. Otherwise, you can continue with the metta practice, the phrases, uh, uh, or just the feelings of metta for the whole session. So just see where your mind wants to go. So especially for metta meditation, it's important to be comfortable and at ease. I'm quite pleased to see some of you lying down. If you're at home, you can do the same if that's good for you. Or sit on your favorite sofa or chair. See what your body needs now. There's no right or wrong. And I always like to begin by establishing mindfulness along with kindness. This beautiful new word, kindfulness. So that kindness informs the mindfulness of how to be aware. So this is bringing right intention to the mindfulness. We're being aware not to change, not to reject, not to make ourselves different or better, but just to be kind. Not to fight reality, but to live a life aligned to reality. So 
So just coming in contact with your body sitting or lying down and noticing. I'm noticing immediately areas that are tense and tight, a little bit contracted and just loosening them up, relaxing my shoulders, back muscles, maybe muscles you don't usually notice that don't need to work so hard. Feeling supported by the ground. Your feet on the ground if you're on a chair. Your legs, buttocks on the ground, on the floor, stable centered, alert and kind. And gently allowing this kindfulness to flow down from the top of the head. Perhaps like butter melting or sunlight drenching your body soaking through every cell with a sense of friendliness and warmth Noticing how this attitude of kindness, of friendship, even towards any areas that are less comfortable, any pains or aches, how that kindness affects those feelings. Prevents you from tightening up, resisting rejecting, but rather embraces everything with a smile. Feeling tensions draining away from your brow, your jaw, your shoulders, draining into the ground. As your body becomes suffused with this kindfulness experiencing sensations, receiving sensations that arise in the mind. Just relaxing the mind. Allowing it to rest in the body and any feelings you experience right now. Just knowing and being kind.
Breathing with the feelings. Landing gently in the here and now. Every moment precious. Every moment new. And for those who wish to join me in the metta meditation, I'd like to invite you to choose a person who is very dear to you. A person who you have a caring relationship with, one that brings joy a feeling of safety, trust, mutual respect. Perhaps someone who is a dear friend or a spiritual teacher or guide. Maybe a grandchild, a nephew or niece. Someone who you have quite a simple, uncomplicated relationship with. Sometimes it's wise to avoid people you're very entangled with, who may bring up different emotions or lots of thoughts. So just take a little bit of time to find a person who quickly brings a smile and a feeling of ease to your heart. Getting a sense of their presence, how it feels to be with them. Perhaps an image or impression of their face comes to mind. And imagine that they're right here with you, seated or standing, wherever you wish them to be. And you can see them smiling, relaxed, at ease. As you look into their eyes. And wish them well. Tuning in to how they may feel and what they may need right now. And staying connected to your own body 
and especially to any feelings around the chest or anywhere in the body that feels fairly pleasant or neutral, relaxed. And see if you can formulate some simple wishes towards this being, such as, may you be happy. May you be free. May you be safe. May you be at peace. Tailoring these wishes to this person who's in front of you right now. And repeating between maybe two and four phrases as though offering them as a gift from your heart to theirs. Listening to the meaning of each phrase and pausing in that space in between as though planting a seed in the heart or in fertile soil and allowing the warmth of the sun, your awareness and kindness to shine in between, inclining the mind to the meaning of metta, the meaning of loving kindness that can be felt in your heart. May you be happy. May you be free. May you be safe. May you be at peace. And finding your own rhythm staying connected to your body, to the image or the sense of this person in front of you. And pausing in the gaps to allow your mind to incline towards loving kindness. If your mind is distracted or thinking a lot, then you might wish to say the phrases fairly frequently. of loving kindness, you may find you can pause for longer between each phrase. Just enjoying this act of giving without looking for anything special, without expecting anything in return, just giving in order to give rejoicing in the beauty of these intentions and trusting the power of these beautiful, pure intentions to yield the fruits of loving kindness in time. So I'll be quiet now and you can just enjoy 
practicing loving kindness as long as you wish. Whatever arises, including that in the field of your kindness,
And if you find the mind wandering away or losing the meaning of the practice, then just once again refresh this person's image or presence in your mind, this dear friend who means so much. And connect with your heart's most deeply felt wishes for them. Trusting that every wish, every intention of loving kindness will have its effect. Feeling into the meaning of each phrase. And its effect in your body and mind.
So we're coming close to the end of the meditation, which is optional, of course. <laughs> so just again noticing any feelings that have arisen, maybe a softness or lightness, a greater sense of ease. Well, sometimes when we're practicing loving kindness, we face the obstacles, a sense of frustration or even nothing particular, maybe dullness, tiredness, just noticing without judgment, appreciating that you tried, you developed intentions of loving kindness, which will help to purify the mind. So allowing this person's image to fade, perhaps with a feeling of appreciation, respect, allowing the words to subside for now. And just sensing again into your body. With friendship, with gratitude. Allowing any pleasant feelings to suffuse the whole body. And staying connected to your body, maybe your breath as we end this meditation and move towards some walking meditation. So I'll ring the bell and at the end of the ring you can gently open your eyes. With a smile, please. That's all I ask. Yay! Got some smiles. <laughs> <coughs> so now <coughs> it's your optional uh, session. You can move into some walking meditation or continue sitting in here as you wish. And uh, for anyone who's new today, would anyone like a few words on the me uh, walking meditation? Are you all okay? Yeah? So um, upstairs there are a couple of rooms you can use. There's a basement as well. And we choose a basically a length of the room, which is usually the, uh, the width ways. So there's enough space for many people. So you have a, a path in front of you. You can keep your eyes gently down. And just see if you can keep most of your mindfulness in your feet and in the way that the feet are moving and the sensations in the feet as they lift, as they move and land back down. So obviously you'll feel the weight of your body in the foot. You'll feel maybe pressure, maybe some temperature and whatever feelings arise, just to be aware and mindful of those. Again, with a sense of kindness, relaxation and ease. So you'll probably find you're walking a little bit more slowly than you would getting from maybe the bus stop to your house or whatever. Um, but try and keep it fairly natural. So notice if the body's getting stiff or tight and just relax. So at the end of the path is a good opportunity to reset, just pause, reestablish your mindfulness, especially if you find you're thinking a lot. And just again, 
Feel your feet, maybe feel your body standing, relax everything and then turn around and come back. If um, you do love to practice the metta meditation or want to continue that theme, um, you can either relate to your body with a sense of kindness and love as though your body is your friend, or you can even continue to, from time to time, drop in those phrases of loving kindness. This is especially helpful for people who tend to think a lot, or maybe if you have a little bit of a brittleness of mind, you know, the mind is a bit grumpy or tired or just a bit lost. It can be lovely to bring these phrases up because they're really refreshing, they're really positive, and they tend to gladden the mind. So you can also continue in that way. I once did a meta retreat in Italy and we were encouraged to keep with the phrases the whole day even while we ate. So we had to find different, you know, speeds and frequency of using them, but it was lovely to just keep on bringing up those beautiful thoughts and uh, the meta really started to develop. So I'll leave that up to you.